Okay, as part of a dare, I said I could do this in 30 minutes. Uh, so we're gonna do this in 30 minutes. Be, please be aware that I do know, I am fully aware of the fact that I stand between you and beer. We will not be going over. <laughs> um, because I know if it's me against beer, we're gonna, I'm gonna lose, all right? So, um, so I'm gonna get rolling very quickly. Uh, I'm going to keep the ceremony to an absolute minimum and we're going to cover things at a very, uh, very rapid pace and uh, be covering all the foundational stuff. By all means, if you have more questions, comments, feedback, whatever later, please do ping me. Uh, I do wanna ask that you remember to uh, complete your feedback in the application. Any feedback is welcome. Um, just remember that I normally give this talk in 50 to 60 minutes, so. Okay, <laughs> so uh, welcome to this afternoon session on springing into Kotlin, how to make the magic even more magical. Uh, my name is Mark Heckler. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a spring developer advocate with Pivotal. Uh, I will skip the, all the extra stuff that I normally say as kind of introduction, uh, but I will say that uh, if you want to reach me, the best way, the absolute best way is Twitter. I live on Twitter. Literally some months, I live on Twitter more than I live in my house, and that's no exaggeration. Uh, but if you're not on Twitter, I'm also on email. It's a necessary evil. Uh, these are the two email addresses that I check the least infrequently. Uh, I'm not on them all the time like I am Twitter, but I can be reached there, so by all means, please do reach out. Happy to talk about this stuff at length, even past the 30, definitely past the 30. Uh, does anyone not know who I am? Okay, that's cool, uh, that's fair. Uh, really quickly, I've co-authored a couple of books. I've written several blogs and blog posts. Uh, I've contributed content and code to other books, some of which even recognize my contributions. That was always nice. Um, but uh, it's all open source. I am a speaker developer and Java champion. Uh, I am a seeker of a better way and an a pursuer of efficiency and elegance, thus the, uh, the intro to Kotlin, right? Um, and I do, of course, again, work for Pivotal, so. Um, we're gonna skip that. I just like to throw that in because uh, how to make the magic more magical. It's a frequent uh, knock by those who aren't in the know on spring that it's too much magic. It's not magic, it's technology. I think we all know that. Uh, so what are the goals for today? Uh, very much at a high level, we're gonna answer the why is why would you consider a move to Kotlin? Uh, why switch from Java, even partially? Uh, what do we gain, is it worth it? What are some quick victories and what are the longer term gains that we might experience? Uh, I like to summarize this all in, in a way that I know some people may not necessarily love, but I consider Kotlin to be sort of like Java++. It is, uh, if you're looking for a feature to come out of Java, if it's promised, it's, if it's on the roadmap, chances are it's probably already in Kotlin. Uh, the Kotlin engineers are not held back by 20 years of legacy, uh, and that's not a knock on anyone, uh, because uh, the, uh, the Java, uh, architectural team have been very, very good about maintaining backward compatibility to an extreme degree until Java 9, which is rather unfortunate, but eh, whatever. Um, so you have some very uh, forward-leaning uh, architects and developers of Kotlin. So you get some very nice capabilities and features which uh, tend to make things a lot more concise. Uh, I've never had a problem, I'm not one of those folks who has a problem with verbosity, never have. Because if something is verbose but clear, as they say, your compiler reads your code once, you read it every day. Uh, but if there, on the other hand, if there's a way to, to say the same thing, to get the job done in much less code and still be clear and concise, I think that's worth exploring, right? And that's where Kotlin comes in. So uh, this is, I feel like the best way to see things and understand them is to, to actually dig in and, and do them, right? Uh, so, so let's code. Uh, does everyone know who this guy is? Yeah, Maurice Moss from the IT crowd. Those of you who don't, uh, fortunately we're coming up on a weekend, uh, and, and last I checked, the IT crowd is on Netflix. It's a Britcom from a few years ago. Uh, just an excellent series. It'll make you laugh, it'll make you cry, it'll hit too close to home at times, but it is well worth uh, watching, so. Uh, wow, that's the fastest I've ever done that introduction. Uh, now, to start off with, uh, chances are if you're starting into Kotlin uh, with Spring, uh, I mean, there, there may be, your boss may come to you and say, hey, I want you to write this greenfield application, Spring, Spring Boot in Kotlin. And you'll say, yay, that's great. But chances are, most of the time, we deal with a lot of brownfield apps, right? 
so I think it makes a lot of sense to look how you would take an existing Spring Boot and Java application and start maybe gradually transitioning that to Kotlin. And that's a wonderful thing about Kotlin to start off with, which is it's very interoperable with Java. So you can have some Kotlin files, some Java files uh, in your, your application, and everything is just harmonious. It's so nice. Um, but to get started, I've already created this Brownfield project, a very simple project. Again, we only have 30 minutes. Uh, but I've, I've also gone through the Spring Initializer and created a Kotlin build script. Now, I'd recommend you do this, whether you have Greenfield or Brownfield, because it keeps you from maybe making a typo and it gets all your dependencies in that you will want to have, your dependencies, your plugins, what have you. Um, I'm using Kotlin 1.2.70, um, which is actually uh, 1.2.71 just came out. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll save you, I'll spare you the, the concerns, but there was one little thing that I found that I don't want to necessarily bring into the, the demo, so I'm just sticking with two days ago version of Kotlin. Kotlin inter iterates very quickly, and generally speaking, it's very smooth to transition, so uh, that's one nice thing as well. You don't have these six-month speed bumps or a three-month long-term uh, service release or what have you. It's, it's just very much a, a continuous delivery type of language. Okay, so I'm using, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm using very, um, uh, very much a kind of a plain vanilla application. I've created, uh, I guess let's just take a quick look at this. Can everyone see this? Should I blow this up a bit? I probably should blow this up a bit, shouldn't I? Let's see. Uh, come on. Font. And we'll take this up to the ambiguous setting. That's my favorite. Okay, is that better? Much. Okay, so... Um, let's see, so, yeah, better, all right. So here's our application. Uh, the only thing that's uh, of particular note in here is that you have a uh, command line runner bean, which I'm just using to, to feed some sample data. I'm creating an array, uh, a, a list of, of coffee types, and then I'm streaming that, mapping that to a new coffee, well, a new coffee object, and then saving it, and then at the end I'm just printing everything out so I can make sure it's all there. So nothing terribly fancy there. Uh, our domain is also very simple. Uh, it's, by the way, I love coffee, so pretty much every demo you'll ever see me do has coffee in it somehow. Uh, this is our coffee service. <laughs> Actually, this is our coffee domain object, uh, domain class. So we see that we're using Mongo. We have the at document annotation here, and I've, I've annotated the ID with at D, cleverly enough. Uh, we have three member variables, uh, ID, type, and code. The type is just the name of the coffee. The code is actually a derived value from the type, and we're, I'm just taking that and kind of slugifying it, if you will. I'm, I'm removing spaces, replacing them with a dash, lower casing everything, giving us another way to perhaps search for a particular coffee in our data, in our uh, repository of coffees. We have our NORGS constructor for Jackson, uh, marshaling and unmarshaling. We have our uh, single, uh, single parameter constructor here with type. Uh, the reason we can do that is, of course, because Mongo will provide our, our ID for us, so that's nice. And again, code is a derived value. We have our getters, we have our setters, we have our equals, hash code, and two-string methods. So it's a very, again, very straightforward domain class, right? Uh, then we have our repository, also fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. I'm just extending the plain old cred repository in Spring Data. I am adding a method here. Uh, I, with Spring Data, those of you who don't know, you can define method signatures, and as long as you follow a convention, uh, Spring Data is kind enough to provide the implementation for that. And you can get terribly fancy. This isn't. This is a fairly straightforward example. Uh, I'm doing a find coffee by type, providing the type, of course, and returning an optional of coffee. Uh, here we have our controller, and again, this is a fairly simple example. I'm just creating a REST controller with a request mapping of slash coffees. Uh, and I have, uh, I'm, I guess I should say I'm injecting our coffee repo uh, proxy bean so we can use that. Uh, and then I have three endpoints. One is just to return all coffees, an iterable of coffees. Uh, the next is to search, or I should say, to retrieve a particular coffee by its ID uh, by providing a path variable, of course. And then I've got a search capability in here. The idea being, of course, that if this is going to be rolled out to baristas worldwide, and I'm sure it will, I'm sure the demand is just building for this service. But if it were, uh, then they may want to uh, search for a particular type of coffee, by its name, of course. They may also just want to, or by accident, do a search without providing a value. Now, we can come back with an error, or we can provide a meaningful default. So perhaps we could return with the house blend. 
or the flavor of the day or what have you. I'm doing a very simple example here. I'm just returning an optional of the first uh, document in the uh, data store. So again, it's a fairly simple application, uh, all written in Java. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, convert this uh, kind of live and in real time uh, so we can see how that works out, uh, hopefully quite well. The one thing I will tell you after creating your uh, settings that you will want in your, your new build.gradle file that includes your Kotlin plugins and dependencies and what have you, uh, is that this is not absolutely, I should start with, this is not absolutely essential, but in my mind it is. I'm a little OCD about this. Uh, but I have created a set of parallel packaging here under the Java and Kotlin directories. So, in fact, everything is located here under com.theheckler's.coffee service. I've created a parallel package, com.theheckler's.coffee service, here under my Kotlin directory. Okay? And as I convert each one of these, I think it makes a lot of sense to move those. Uh, IntelliJ will give you a visual cube, but perhaps not everyone's using IntelliJ. God forbid. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I should ask, who uses IntelliJ here? Oh, wow, that's excellent. Uh, Eclipse? Really? Okay, okay. anyway. Uh, sorry, just kidding. Uh, NetBeans? Nobody? Not even, like, employer makes you? Okay, that's kind of sad. Um, uh, everything is supported. Uh, Visual Studio Code, that's great too. Vim, uh, just please, 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 never, ever use Emacs. Have a little self-respect, okay? Yeah. All right, so uh, just kidding, just kidding. No, no Emacs people come throw things at me. It's, it's all good. Uh, love you all. Okay, so, so <laughs> I have to say that. Uh, okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just start by um, converting. Actually, what do I want to do? I probably want to start with my domain class, right? Uh, that I find uh, quite nice, uh, quite easily done. So I'm going to start, let's see, if I can remember the key combination here. Uh, there it is. Okay, I'm going to change this from coffee.java to coffee.kt. Now that's, that's good. This is exactly what we hoped would happen. IntelliJ recognizes this correctly as a Kotlin file now. But we've got a lot of work ahead of us, right? We can't just leave it like this. There are rules. This isn't groovy. So let's just bring this down. <laughs> Let's just bring this down to our Kotlin directory, right? Everything's fine. And let's get busy. Let's get to work. Okay, so uh, rather quickly, let's see. How are we doing on time? Already 12 minutes. Where does the time go? Okay, so the first thing you might, well, actually, let me back up. The first thing you might notice is we have a kind of a subdued looking semicolon there. That's because semicolons are not required in Kotlin. It's the little things, isn't it? It's so nice. Uh, so we're going to get rid of that. Uh, the next thing you probably might notice is that public is also a bit subdued. Uh, in Kotlin, the default visibility for everything is public. So we can get rid of that. That cleans things up, not tremendously, but it's kind of nice, right? Um, the next thing that we come to is our member variables and our constructors and things like that. Uh, Kotlin handles things a little bit differently. Uh, rather than having member variables and getters and setters, or if you prefer, accessors and mutators, I had a friend of mine once who said he liked to refer to them that way because it made him sound smarter. But whatever, um, I don't stand on a lot of ceremony. Uh, so uh, you don't have member variables and getters and setters in Kotlin, you have properties. And again, uh, by default, everything is public. Uh, so you can change that. You can have uh, immutable values that are you just have a getter for and what have you, but, but by default, you have kind of the getters and setters functionality baked in, right? Uh, so let's start by creating our, our constructor. Now this is another kind of interesting thing. Uh, in Java, you're probably used to creating several constructors for any given class, uh, because you want different set combinations of parameters to create a particular object, and that's fine. Uh, Kotlin takes a dramatically different approach. In most cases, you only have a, a single primary constructor. You can have secondary constructors, that's perfectly fine, but in most cases, they aren't needed. And if you have a primary constructor, you can list it right up here in the class header. So let's go ahead and uh, let's, let's kind of bring these things up a little bit. And um, let me just end this here and start the class there. I'm going to come back to our code. But let's jump back up here to our, our constructor uh, parameters here. So annotation is fine. 
Um, again, these are going to be properties, so we don't want them private. We want them to be uh, default visibility, which is public, so we can have getters and setters, potentially. Uh, with Kotlin, you don't have type and variable name. You have variable name, colon, type. So that's a little bit different. Uh, you also can either make this a var, so it is mutable. You can assign and uh, to your heart's content repeatedly, or you can have it as a val. And what this allows you to do is, is effectively like a Java final, right? So you can assign to it once. Uh, so that's pretty good. That's our ID. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing here with our type, val type string. Now, as it is, both of these are type string, which means they can literally only hold strings. And why is that important? They only hold strings. What if you want something to be nullable? In Kotlin, by default, values are not nullable, or variables are not nullable when they're assigned a particular type. This can literally, the ID and the type, can only be of value string. What happens if you don't maybe know if you have a string? What happens if you want a potentially nullable value? You can make it a string. See, the inflection's very important. String, I always have a string, it's always a string, or string. Anyway, that's how I like think of it. Anyway, so this is nullable, right? Now, most of the time this isn't really a huge going concern, but again, Mongo's going to be providing our ID for us, so at least initially we need to have this uh, at a null value. So I'm just assigning a, or I'm providing a default value, which is another capability of Kotlin, as null for the time being, and this isn't a problem in this particular case, but again, be careful when you use this. Um, for our type, I want to provide a default value of any old Joe, right? That's a sad coffee name, so hopefully it'll never happen. But by providing default values, that means you can omit parameters from your constructor, which is very important, again, which gives you a lot more versatility and flexibility with your constructor. Now, I should say before I go any further that you don't even need that keyword, and most of the time you simply just don't see it, because when you create your constructor in the header, it's rather obvious that it's a constructor in the header. So we can go ahead with that. So that shortens things up a bit more. Now, since we have our primary constructor in our header, we can get rid of our other constructors listed here. And again, I'm going to go ahead and just save the code to address later. Uh, these are properties that we've listed in our header, our, our constructor, so we can get rid of our getters and setters, right? So that cleans that up quite nicely. Uh, but we still have our equals hash code and two string. Kotlin has a concept of a data class. For any classes, and those of you who are familiar with Lombok, for instance, have probably run into this, but, um, uh, but the concept of a data class is basically that you have a data container, something you assign values to and retrieve values from, right? Some people love them, some people don't. I find them useful. Uh, so we're going to make this a data class. And as a data class, Kotlin will provide implementations of your equals, your hash code, your toString, and a handful of other things that we can talk about later as well. But you don't need to provide these, right? Equals, hash code goes away, toString. But what if you want to provide something? What if you want to override the default toString, for example? It's very easily done. Uh, you simply start with override fun to string. Which brings me to my next point. Kotlin does not have methods. It has functions. And the keyword for our functions in Kotlin is fun, which is where we get the expression, everything is fun in Kotlin, right? So we're going to override our fun, our function of to string, uh, which also brings me to the next thing that I can save some serious uh, text on. Uh, in Kotlin, if you have a, a, a method, function, uh, that is the implementation of which is provided by a single expression, you don't have to go through the ceremony of the braces and the return. You can simply do an assignment, right? So that allows us to clean this up even a bit more. Uh, so let's do that. And now we're still left with this kind of mess of a two-string. This is not anything unusual. If you've developed in Java more than 30 minutes, you've created a two-string function or a, a string manipulating, manipulating function, something like this. A string, and you concatenate that with a value and another string and another value, and it gets to be this rather cumbersome mess. Uh, Kotlin has what's called string templates, which is a really nice way to say you can just format 
your strings and embed the values within. Uh, oops, I just uh, jumped ahead of myself a little bit. So I'm going to do, I'm going to create a string template here uh, and just bring this all up very nicely. And we haven't done anything with our code as yet. Let me do that so that gets that a little bit cleaner. So we still have a little bit of a, a red mark here that we're ignoring for the time being. Uh, but that, uh, that looks much better, right? Now, let's come back to our code. How do we do this? How do we create our derived value? Well, there are several ways to do this. I'm going to start with the way that you probably would not do in this case. I don't see a really good reason to do it, but it gives me an opportunity to show you some capabilities in Kotlin uh, that I, uh, I think fit in kind of well at this point. So with our code, I'm just gonna remove that. And what we can do is create an extension function. Uh, in Kotlin, every class is closed for extension by default. You can't extend that. So uh, you can if you add the open keyword before the class whatever. So open class coffee, open class my class, what have you. Uh, and you have to do the same thing for your functions. Uh, but uh, if you have a closed class, let's say for the string class, and you want to extend the capabilities of that, what you can do is create a fun and Kotlin, again, has top-level functions, so we can just create that out here. String dot do something. Like that. I'll actually do this for real here, and we'll just say fun uh, coffee. <laughs> I just gave this talk in Spanish like three days ago, and I'm, I sometimes flip over. Sorry about that. Uh, so we've got code, right? So we will make our code equal to uh, this. That's for the current object in, uh, under consideration dot type, dot replace. We're going to, again, replace our spaces with a dash. Uh, and then we'll take that to lowercase. And that, nope, eliminate the semicolons. So that's one way of doing it. Again, since uh, uh, this is not a typical way you would do this in this particular circumstance, but you can. It's, it's certainly allowed. You can also create extension values or variables. So that's pretty easy. You just... Uh, uh, make this equal, we get, um, let's see, get, oops, get, there we go. So that all works. And again, that's technically possible, but we have the code for our coffee class right here. So that's probably not something you'd want to do. I just like to show that capability because it does come in exceedingly handy in many, many other cases. So how would we do this? Well, we would put this functionality where it belongs, right? Right in our coffee class. So the easiest and probably most appropriate way to create this is just like this. So very simple, right? Now, here's the kicker. If we didn't override our toString, if we didn't have a derived value, here's what our data class, our domain object, our domain class definition would look like. That's it. I mean, this isn't bad, but that's amazing, right? How much more maintainable is that than this? And this is a tiny domain class, right? So it, it makes a rather huge -ish difference uh, in terms of maintainability uh, and the ability to debug it and what have you. So, so we've done that. Uh, let's see, I have 17 minutes left. So I think that's enough time to, uh, do I wanna do this? No, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna wait and run everything at the end and test it at the end, because that always works, right? Okay, cool. Yep, what could possibly go wrong? Okay. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is our repository, our coffee repository. <sighs> now, I showed you the manual way of doing it, and that's not overly onerous, but in a big code base, that could take some time, right? Uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a reason, another reason to use IntelliJ if you're, you're working with projects, you're wanting to try to convert to Kotlin. All right, go up here. I'm gonna zoom in on that here. Everybody see that? Convert Java file to Kotlin file. Oh, so nice. Again, what could possibly go wrong, right? Okay, so we're going to try that. And indeed, for a small interface or class, it actually, not much, really can go wrong. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we see our coffee repository, once again, was converted to a Kotlin interface, as de defined. So we're just going to drag that down here. Uh, again, the OCD in me thanks you for indulging. Uh, so we've got that done. Short work of that, right? 
I guess I should go back and at least try to run things a couple junctures. Uh, I do need to, let's see, I do need to actually change this a bit because the fact that our main, well, our command line runner bean is still written in Java and we're interacting with a Kotlin class here, we do need to provide a little bit more information because uh, I want to provide a uh, null value, so because Java expects all parameters to be provided, of course, that are, uh, that are listed in a, param in a uh, constructor. Uh, so that's effectively all we have to change in our Java command line runner bean to make this work. In theory, let me knock on wood here. Let's try this. I should have run this to start with so you could see what the functionality was. I, I didn't even think about it. Uh, just in my rush to make sure I didn't run out of time. Um, so we've got our four coffees that I've listed. Uh, Caldi Coffee, which is actually from my hometown in St. Louis, the hometown I never visit. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, one, once, a couple times a year I'm there, so I drink Caldi coffee. Uh, Café Cereza, which is a uh, Colombian blend, which is a very nice coffee. Café de Olla, which is a superb Mexican coffee. If you ever get to Mexico, you must, must, must try the homemade Café de Olla. It's amazing. And, of course, the r typical run-of-the-mill house blend of Pike Place, right? So we've got them all there. They look like they're being stored properly. Uh, let's go ahead and try to run our combined Java and Kotlin app. Let me blow this up a bit more. And there we go. So I use HTTP. Again, it's nice. It kind of shortens a few of the commands of curl. If you are hitting localhost, you don't have to provide the host name. So coffees. Bam. So that all works, right? We knew it would. Um, and then I'm going to, let's grab the Café de Olla. And that works. So we can retrieve a particular coffee by its ID. Uh, I'm going to next do a search and provide our type equals, uh, let's do Pike Place, right? Pike Place. Uh, let's see. So I need to, uh, I use Z shell, so I need to enclose that in quotes. So that's fine, Pike Place. What happens if we search and uh, don't provide a particular type? That's fine. It defaults to our default. Uh, behavior, right? The principle of least astonishment. In this case, we're saying you just get whatever we give you. This is your flavor of the day. Call it coffee it is. So that all works. We've already converted half of our application, more or less, uh, to Kotlin. So that's pretty good. Everything seems to be playing well together. Uh, so let's go back and convert the rest. So we have our, our domain class. We have our repository. Now, the repository worked just fine when we did the automatic conversion. So why not the controller, right? Let's find out. Oh, now here's something. Uh, what this is basically telling us is it says, hey, some code in the rest of your project may require corrections after performing this conversion. Do you want to find such code and correct it too? Sure, why not, right? <laughs> OK, we're feeling good today. Uh, well, that's not horrible, but here's something interesting I find that IntelliJ does. Not really sure why. It's, the behavior is a bit inconsistent. But if you notice my three methods in Java became two functions and a val with a get. I don't know. It works. I don't like it. My OCD kicks in, and I feel like this has to be fixed. Uh, so we will fix it. But let's go through and make this a bit more consistent, because we, we can do just a smidge better than the, uh, than the conversion can. So uh, let me close that out. Let's start here with our get coffee by ID. Again, this is a single expression this evaluates to, so I'm just going to do a direct assignment. And that's not horrible, right? Looks much better. Now, with Kotlin, Kotlin has type inference. Uh, so we can define our return types, for instance, as an optional coffee, or we can just let Kotlin do it. And IntelliJ dutifully reports what it should be, right? For those of you who have really good eyesight, uh, even with that font, you may see that we have an exclamation point after coffee. Uh, since we're dealing with Kotlin and Java and the intersection of the two, uh, what that's basically saying is that our find by ID, if we go here and look, uh, it returns an optional of type T, but Kotlin can't determine, because it's dealing with Java on the other side, uh, that it is definitely non-nullable. It uh, it's, it's can't be 100% certain of the type. So it leaves that as a with an exclamation point to indicate it's a platform type. Now, 
Spring Framework itself and several components or several modules uh, of other Spring properties, if you will, uh, have been uh, added the JSR 305 style of annotations to indicate nullable or non-nullable values. So uh, method signatures, return types, parameter values, things like that. But it's not 100% there just yet. So thus the, uh, the platform types occasionally do show up. But again, this tells us what we need to know. It's an optional of type coffee. Going on to the next, uh, the next function, uh, we see that this is a string, right? The parameter is a string. Uh, so we know that that may or may not be there. But we also have a bit of redundancy here. We're, we're indicating that our request parameter is false. Requ required is false. Seems a bit redundant. Seems like we should be able to uh, maybe do that, right? And the good news is you can. So that tidies things up a bit. I'm also going to uh, do this here too because if statements in Java translate to if expressions in Kotlin, they return values. So you can directly assign them to something. They return a value. You don't have to do a, uh, a return here. So if this, that. Else, the other. Uh, we don't have to uh, clutter up the code quite so badly. Also, and this is not obviously unique to Kotlin, uh, we can get rid of our uh, brackets here if we have a, a single statement. So that cleans that up just a wee bit more. Uh, and then Kotlin also has ways to maybe add a little more rigor to null checking. Uh, because instead of just checking if something is null, you can do an is null or empty, is null or blank, what have you. Which takes it a little bit further, right? Uh, because we'll probably want to respond the same way if you, we get a null value passed in as if we have a zero length string passed in. It's an empty string. And in either case, we'll want to return that default coffee of the day or house blend or what have you. So that cleans that up pretty well. We've now discovered a small issue. And I've spoken with the Kotlin engineers about this. But Kotlin, once you verify, once you check to see if a value is null, and nothing can affect it in between that and the next operation or what have you, there's no requirement every step to continue rechecking and reassessing if something is null. So once it's, it's determined that this is null, or not null, I should say, uh, you don't have to continually reevaluate. In this case, uh, we know by looking at is null or empty that that's exactly what it does. It checks to see if it's null, and if it's not null, it checks the length. So the fact that it's here, the code executes here, we shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have this warning, right? And what this is saying is type mismatch. It requires a string, but it's, it's actually maybe a string? But we know it's not. So here's the thing that I like to do. There's a thing in Kotlin, an operator in Kotlin called the not null assertion operator. Sounds very formal, right? I call it the hold my beer operator. So you just do this, bang, bang, right? And that gets you the ability to tell Kotlin, stand down. Look, I know this is OK. I know this will not ever have a null value. It's fine. Use that very sparingly and with great caution, OK? <laughs> But in this case, we know it's OK. The Kotlin engineers have said that they will be fixing this uh, to where this actually passes through in terms of, of uh, null checking. But I'm not sure when that will be. So in the meantime, hold my beer, right? OK, so at this point, this is fine. Uh, we could just stop here. But again, full OCD. Let's bring this down here. Let's change this from an internal val to an internal fun. Um, all coffees equals, and there we're done, right? So that's pretty good. Seven minutes. Wow, let's run this. Make sure it all runs. And then we'll go convert the last thing. And then we'll go actually have a beer too, right? OK, so that is all up and running, apparently. So let's go back and hit our coffee's endpoint. That all works. Uh, let's grab the Cafe de Olla. That all works. Uh, let's do our search. No parameters. Oops, typing helps. No parameters. And then. Type equals pike place, for instance. And there we go. That works. OK. So the only thing we have left to convert at this point is this. So let's do it. Uh, once again, into the breach. Unto the breach. Any history fans here? OK, that's fine. So we're going to convert Java to Kotlin. It once again says, hey, do you want me to fix code that may be impacted by this? Sure, why not? This is a little uglier, right? Uh, but it's not irreparable. We can fix this. Uh, so we have a little bit of fixing to do. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is convert my command line runner lambda. 
to be Kotlin idiomatic instead of Java idiomatic. So I'm going to remove some of the extra verbiage here just out of the gate. Uh, and then of course we, again, I should have probably explained this in, in the Java code, we're cleaning up our repository of coffees, we're creating our coffee values, we're saving them and then we're printing them out to make sure they all work, they're all there. Um, so, still doing that, I'm just going to comment these out because the, the red and the pop-ups get annoying. So here we have a, a lambda, right? For our map, uh, we have a, a lambda that we're providing just as we did with Java, but in Kotlin, if you notice, there are no parens. Now you can put them, should you want to, right? Uh, but they're not needed because Kotlin says, hey, I know this is a lambda, why do I need the parens around the brackets? So that cleans things up just a, just a skosh. Uh, we also have here that we don't, once again, with now that we've converted our domain class to Kotlin and this particular invoking of, of our constructor uh, to Kotlin, as in Kotlin, uh, we can just provide this single parameter to our constructor of type. Now, actually, since the, this is our second parameter, we need to say type equals, because again, we have named parameters, so nice. With Kotlin as well, if you have a single parameter lambda, the name for that parameter defaults to it. So we could do that. It's a little more idiomatic, but since we only have the single parameter that defaults to it, we can do that, which is even cleaner, right? It's even shorter. Uh, let's go on down to our for each and do the same thing here. Now, I don't know why the converter brings over and makes this a consumer. By default, a for each takes a lambda. Again, that cleans that up quite nicely as well. Uh, so we're gonna do the same thing here. Uh, let's see, here we go. And again, get rid of all the extra noise. And that makes that pretty clean. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and close out my main application class. Uh, once again, uh, Kotlin has a concept of top level functions, which means even your um, main uh, function in this case doesn't have to be within our main application class. So that's kind of nice. In this case, the converter creates a companion object and JVM static. The companion, companion object is basically um, or I should say JVM static is a way of creating a single static method that applies to all objects. Uh, again, not necessarily necessary in our case, so we can clean that up a bit. Uh, and then let's make this a bit more idiomatic as well. Instead of doing the spring application.run, we'll make a run application, and we will make that of type coffee service application, and there we have it. So that's, that's quite, quite nice, right? So let's run it, make sure it works. That's luxurious. We have three minutes to actually test things and get to the end of the presentation. We may make this yet. All right. So we have coffees. Everything seems to be working just fine. We have our favorites there and, and the other one. And uh, now we go here. Oops. And once again, test our coffees endpoint. That works. Uh, we'll grab Cafe Cereza's ID there. That works. Uh, we'll do a search with no parameters. Of course, that returns quality just fine, so that's our house blend we're gonna offer up by default. And then we make our type equals pike base. Uh, let's see here. And that all works. So just as we would expect it to. Crazy, right? Even in a short time frame. Okay, so that lets me get back to the important part at the end, which is this. Uh, not that, sorry. That didn't happen. All right. So. For those of you who are considering a move to Kotlin, uh, I hope this has actually shown you that it's very easy to start gradually. You don't have to do the big bang, right? You don't have to start with Greenfield. You don't have to convert your entire project at once to see any gains. You can actually make your project much, 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 much more maintainable uh, just by converting your domain classes. Uh, and it's very simple and painless to do. You may have, again, your constructors that you might in be invoking from Java, you might have to adjust just a skosh, but that's it. Uh, and then you can convert as you see fit over time, so incrementally refactor. Uh, at the top is the repo link, please do check it out. Uh, I'll be adding to that, changing it, evolving it, uh, but everything is out there that you saw and maybe a bit more. Uh, Spring.io, of course, for more information about any of our Spring products, any of the, the components, tool chain. Uh, Kotlinlang.org is the place to go for all things Kotlin reference-wise, and Kotlin.link is the place to go if you're interested in Kotlin events and local meetups and hangouts and things like that, hacking sessions. And finally, just thanks for coming, and please stay in touch. Follow me on Twitter, reach out to me on Twitter. Again, the easiest way, my DMs are open. I'm, that's the fastest way to reach me all hours anywhere on the planet. 
And failing that, email. And thanks so much again for coming.